Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to day two of Blackathon. Um, with us today, we have, um, you know, founder and owner and CEO of Conduit, Ryan Robinson. And so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Ryan. Well, actually, a lot bit because he's very accomplished <laughs> um, to be so young. But yeah, so Ryan is a visionary. Um, he's creating quantum technology to um, change the world. Born in Miami, Ryan began taking college classes at Harvard at 16. He then competed in DECA, the world's biggest business competition, and scored in the highest percentile, 99%, for both economics and marketing management. After being accepted to MIT, he began researching dark matter at 18. After studying under Eric Lander, Ryan then created a company named Conduit, dedicated to using computers to create products that solve the world's biggest problems, while still a student at MIT. Advised by Seth Lloyd, Ryan created his own major, quantum engineering, becoming the first quantum engineer in the world at 20. Ryan then graduated from MIT with three majors, mechatronics, international humanities, and quantum engineering. He also published a paper about gender bias in the workplace. At 22, Ryan was named in Forbes Under 30 for Conduit's work in solving real world problems. Ryan then raised over $1 million for Conduit and lectured at MIT about quantum computing and cryptocurrency. Ryan then premiered Conduit's 100 times speed up at MIT, where he was compared to Steve Jobs in his prime by MIT professors. In 2020, Ryan began working with the White House to find a cure for COVID-19 alongside Conduit's lead scientist, Logan Thrasher Collins. With the White House, Conduit used computing power to develop a computational microscope to detect the curvature of the viral membrane and help find therapeutics to stop COVID-19. Ryan Robinson is one of the youngest people to ever work with the White House. Recently, Ryan received his first provisional patent alongside Collins for NanoSplash, an at-home COVID-19 diagnostic test that can detect new strains of COVID. A result of Conduit's computational work, NanoSplash is a combination of nanotechnology and synthetic biology that has shown the potential to save millions of lives from future outbreaks. Brian has been featured in MIT News, American Inno, Boston Business Journal, Information Age, CNN, Mogledom, Forbes, and the World News. Ryan has also been named as one of the most interesting people to ever live. He has lectured at MIT, Carnegie Hall, and Harvard about the future of quantum engineering. In addition to this, Ryan is a published poet and jazz saxophonist. Welcome, Ryan, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was like, wow, I did, I did a lot. That's, that's, that's a lot going on. <laughs> Ryan, do you want to talk to us about what you're going to talk about today? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so everybody, my name is Ryan. Nice to meet you, Ryan Robinson. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, man, yeah, I was like, I'm like, I'm going like memory, memory lane as you were saying a lot of stuff. Um, you know, and a lot of that's so funny when I, I did it just to, to want to do it, but it's, it's cool hearing it, hearing it back, but I'm just, I'm just grateful to be here. We're talking about, talk to you guys about quantum engineering, which I'm really excited about, which I do and live and breathe every day. Um, yeah. And hand it back to you guys. Oh, awesome. So I guess for me, I have, um, well, I know you said you have some stuff that you kind of want to talk about, right? But I did want to ask a question mm -hmm. up front, which is, how did you do it? How did you simultaneously um, go to school at MIT and then also do a startup at the same time? And uh, I mean, of course, a lot of people will hear mm -hmm. that and like understand it's hard and be like, that's amazing. But some people will understand how hard it was and what you had to say, <laughs> yeah. right? So I want you, like, can you go into that? A yeah, little bit? absolutely. Absolutely. So one, it was um, just time-wise, it was like a, a huge crunch. I mean, because I was taking, so all those, you know, degrees, I was taking like twice the course load. So at MIT, there's, you know, the normal course was four classes. And each class is expected to take around 12 hours uh, a week on average. So you might have one that takes 40 hours, one that takes two, but usually it's going to settle around 12. So I was doing like eight classes a classes. So that's what, like 96 weeks or 96 hours a week, you know, just like straight work, even theoretically. Um, so just that alone, how I'm handling that, that load was, was really intense. And then again, like you're saying, doing the company as well on top of that, <laughs> it was pretty crazy. So um, some of the challenges with that was with time, I basically, so I came into my team knowing that 
Uh, I want to have my own business. You know, I have my whole family is full of entrepreneurs. Uh, so my dad had his own law practice. Um, his grandfather had his own landscaping business, and he actually built a lot of buildings in Miami. Um, you know, and I have that on my mom's side too. So it's like just in my blood. So I knew going into my tea from the get go. You know, I want to. This is what I want to do. So I came in with a different strategy, maybe than other people might have. Where I honestly didn't really care about grades or anything like that. It was strictly, strictly, strictly a knowledge thing. Like how much can, how can I absorb as much knowledge as possible? So what, like one thing I did is I made sure to always get enough sleep, you know, cause your brain health, you go study for hours, right? But if your brain doesn't retain it, you know, your brain health goes down, you know, then that's, that's a challenge. Also too, I remember, I remember thinking that it's a marathon, you know, so you don't want to, right. You know, you don't want to sprint that one segment of the marathon and then you're tired for the rest of it. So um, balancing with sleep is number one. Number two is again, being able to look at assignment and say, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm still going to do this assignment, but. You know, the deadline might be tomorrow, so I'm going to do as much as I can, get my sleep, get retained as much as I as, So literally, actually, the way I got through my teeth, funny enough, was um, right before the final, I would just, like, you know, do my thing and study the whole thing. And so I would ace the final. So I would have, like, every class, it was, like, do or die. So, like, you know, the homework, I'm like, all right, I don't, I don't need to do this right now. You take away the content and then do the final. So, like, every, literally every final, I had to basically ace it <laughs> to, to make it to the next step. Um, because again, I was just, I just had a different mentality on it. And so it worked out. It got me the result I wanted. So that, that's for the school part. For the uh, business part of it, oh man, it's crazy my challenges. One was that I think just getting the support because when you're inside uh, a school, right, and you're starting a business, it's like it doesn't have the same legitimacy to the people inside that school. So trying to kind of convince people on a high level, right, to contribute when they have so many other things vying for their attention, I think was, was really, really challenging. But the benefit of that was that when I graduated, you know, I already had practically, practically speaking, like two, three years of business experience, like legitimate business experience. Um, so like founders leaving, team leaving, they're coming, they're going, lawyers, all that stuff like I had. So I, when I graduated, I had this like technical, theoretical, you know, background, but I also had this like real world application of how do you actually make this stuff happen? So that was really cool. And some of the sacrifices, man, I remember having like parties and, you know, for the after party, you know, it would actually just be like a business planning meeting. We just we would just be like, yeah, we just plan out different marketing strategies and everything, get a big whiteboard, you know. So that, that was really fun. That was really fun. But again, yeah, definitely in terms of time and relationships too. I mean, that's that's a big thing. You just don't really have time for for relationships. So a lot of like my friends, you know, and this is an MIT thing, not just the business thing, but you know, I would see them maybe two times a year, something like that. And that we'd be like best buds. You'd be like, oh my God. You know, we're like, keep in mind, we're living literally across the street. Like it's not like, you know, they're in like somewhere else. Like they're literally across the street. And seeing them twice was like, wow, you know, you, you made it my top five. So, <laughs> but yeah, that was some of the sacrifices. Um, but I guess to, to end my answer to that question, I would say is that, you know, anything in life, it's about what you put in, you know, whatever you put in, you'll get out, you know, and that's a law of the universe, you know, for every action, equal and opposite reaction, you know, Newton. So for me, you know, I've given a lot to condo, but at the same time, I've also gotten a lot out of it. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, I know I went to one of your events. I think you spoke for um, the Harvard career. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so I'm mm. wondering, um, I know you were talking a little bit about some projects that y'all are working on. So what are y'all, what are y'all working right now over at Conduit? Oh, man. So it's, it's really exciting. Um, and it's not just me saying that, like, as you know, I scripted mine as CEO, but like, you know, we all really enjoy what we're doing. And so we're working on two major projects right now. They're, they're both COVID related. So the first one is with the White House. So the White House work, um, like you mentioned in the intro, is we're basically we're, we're, we're measuring the, the curvature, the curvature of the viral membrane, meaning we're, we're basically looking at the geometry. How does this thing come together? And we're looking at the biology. It's, it's geometry meets biology, right? But it's run on computers. So it's like all the, all the, 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 the key words you want to throw in there. So you've got computers, you've got biology, you've got mathematics. Again, you've got geometry. Um, you know, so all these big things and then logistics of, you know, coordinating that across different people, different organizations. So right now working with what's called the White House HPC Consortium, High Performance Computing Consortium. Um, and so that was, of course, made in response to COVID. Um, and so what we saw was basically the, the use of big data, right, to turn the pandemic. Um, and it's like this very kind of like exclusive thing, like you have to apply and be, you know, that to say, okay, this is worth giving you access to like, you know, these huge government facilities that are, you know, billion dollar projects. So right now we're working with Frontera, for instance, they're like the eighth biggest recruiter in the world. Um, so, and it was right up our alley because again, going to the uh, MIT professor comment is that 
we, um, we, when we came into the pandemic, our expertise was in supercomputing. That was like our thing. So like biology, computers. And so going into this, we were like the people you would call. And so it's been a really great experience because one, we were like the youngest people doing it. Um, number one, number two, obviously it's also really diverse. Just like, I mean, the team we have are people from like Egypt and India and London and, you know, Michigan and Miami and, you know, different colors and shapes and sizes. Um, so it's pretty cool. It's, it's really cool. It's not, there's not as many women as I would like, you know, just from that angle of diversity, but in terms of like, uh, ethnicity, class, nationality, it, it is really diverse. So it's cool to, you know, leverage that. And also too, to that point that we're, all, we're doing all this work pro bono to all that white house work is all pro bono, you know, it's not, yeah. So <laughs> we're like, you know, staving away or whatever to, to do this. Uh, but it's literally like for the sake of, of people, um, you know, and that's why I made conduit was to really create. Um, products and things right just things that help people and so we were making progress on that our paper should be out uh, preprint should be out in a few months and then the publication should be out uh in the summer so that's project one the white house and that's led by logan thrasher collins who's like insane by the way and i'll talk about him in a second um, then we have the covid diagnostic test so that's called nano splash so nano splash works like a bottle you guys can see it on our, on our website conduit computing.com conduit computing.com uh, and some people say you can't do it. I'm gonna throw that joke out there already, so we can just kill that. Uh, but <laughs> I get that a lot. And uh, but no, but it is a good joke. But so conduitcomputing.com, you're gonna see our bottle. And what it is, it's really cool. It, it's it's a bottle. And imagine like a listerine bottle. You know, you got the chemical in there, and you spin the bottle, and the and the bottle, the color inside, the chemical inside changes colors to tell you if you have COVID or not in minutes. I mean, really, really fast stuff. So it's it's a test that has really have four major advantages. One, two, three, four. So one, it can be taken at home. So you don't have to drive to like, you know, stadium or hospital, or whatever. You can do it at your house. So that's number one, taking it at home. Number two is that it also works really quick. Like it's not like two, three days and you got to wait for your results. And that, uh, sometimes I know a lot of people have told me they don't even get their results back. So, you know, that's not a problem. That's obvious because it's right there in your hand. So that's two. Then three um, is that it's not, it's not painful. You know, I've done the CVS one a lot, the nasal swab thing. And it's so, so, so painful. You know, you're crying, you're like breaking tears in front of like the CVS worker, like you know them, like you have an emotional breakdown, you know, like you're like, somebody just broke up with you or something and you needed a bowl of ice cream. And so it was crazy, crazy. And then of course I was doing it and then this other car drove the wrong way. So I'll make an eye contact with this one car as I'm crying, you know, sniffling tears. But um, but it's not painful. Our nano so our test, yeah, our test is, our test is painful. Um, and the biggest thing honestly is that it can adapt to new strands of COVID. So that's the problem right now is that uh, that we've been, you know, we talk about internally is that, um, you know, there's going to be, a, the corona is not going away, you know, not, it's not going away. So um, for us, there's going to be, um, you know, we're, we're looking at the world right now, how the world's going to look after COVID or even I would say rather after this specific strand or two strands of COVID. And that's been a really interesting discussion uh, inside the company. One of the big things is that, again, is that the, it's not really going to go away because, I mean, it, it, it was here before, you know, and I mean, this goes in the whole like COVID talk, but it was here before, you know, so it's not going to just, just go away. Um, I think people don't really understand how fast this thing mutates. I mean, it's like, so in three days, you have one virus. This is not like even the COVID virus. This is a generic virus. This is any virus, particularly an RNA virus. If, you know, say a mosquito bites you and that's has, and has malaria, that malaria virus will mutate in three days to more viruses in your body than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Like insane. I mean, you're talking about like counting up all the grains of sand type like quantity and you can see that's why for us, you know, as data scientists, we kind of understood that, the, that mathematics, right, that exponential slope. I said, okay, we got to, you know, do something here. So the adaptability was the first thing that we looked at. Um, now, for us as a company, of course, our first vision wasn't like, okay, let's wait for this pandemic, you know, like, guys, don't worry, just sit, sit down a few years, you know, that wasn't our plan. It was really to create quantum technology that helps people. Number one, create quantum technology that helps people. So even the reason we had done the computing work in the first place was to simulate the quantum computing. So as any of you who study quantum computing know or heard of it, is that basically it's not there yet. It's very, very, very primitive. Um, even though you guys might see like some of the articles like, oh, it's here, it's, it's a quantum supremacy. That's like, I, I'm gonna tell you guys that's a bold-faced lie. <laughs> it's a lot, that's a lot of media like marketing and stuff like that. Um, and so it's, it's a lot, what happens basically is people who are like, they're trying to get hype, and I, I get it. It's, you know, they're trying to get hype for their products or their whatever. And they're telling the journalists to, you know, to, that this is what it is. Or the journalists taking it, obviously, a step further. But it, it's not, it's nowhere near. Um, and same thing with AI. A lot of these technologies, they're nowhere near what we would think they are if you actually are in those spaces. Um, we were in crypto. We left that. 
you know, we were actually in, in the, we were deep in the quantum space, like using quantum computers. This was back in 2018 before the, um, the White House work. And we were in it. Um, again, that's my major, my specialty, my whole claim to fame. And even I was like, all right, you know, um, I didn't let that distract me. So this is a little too early. So how do we build our way to that quantum future? So the collective computing, the network part of it, the computer part of it, came into play with saying, okay, we can simulate this quantum computing faster or better than it's being actually run and performed today. So in other words, with our collective computer versus your, you know, quote unquote, run of the mill quantum computer, we can basically do more quantum computing than you can. You know, that was, that's what we, why we made it. And then from there, we use that to design physical, um, in-person uh, hardware products, physical products. So that's where you're seeing nano splash come out because it uses nanotechnology. So nano and quantum, you know, they go hand in hand. And so as you'll see in the future, we'll be making more and more um, quantum products where it's like basically it's going to get more and more sci-fi. That's like the simple version of it. It's going to get more and more sci-fi looking. It's going to get really cool. And so this is just the beginning. Uh, we're going to see uh, a larger line of quantum computing or quantum engineering products. Now, that's really interesting, Ryan. One thing that you just said that intrigued me was that nano and quantum kind of go hand in hand. Can you explain a little yeah. bit more about that? Like, yeah, absolutely. Actually... Absolutely. I'd love to. Um, and so basically, I'm, I'm going to pretend like, you know, people out here have not really heard of it. So if everyone's already heard of it, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. So with nano, right? So nano is a prefix and it, it refers to um, an abbreviation, right? For a, a certain a size, a scale. Um, so for instance, if you say like a 10th, right, I want a 10th of a pizza or a 10th of an ounce or a 10th of an ounce of, you know, um, ingredient for my cooking, then that's, that's a, referring to a scale you know, a measurement, right? So a 10th, obviously one tenth, we know that, right? One hundredth, obviously we know that. So 10 to the, to, so nano is 10 to the negative nine. So in other words, really, really, really small compared to whatever it is you're, you're referring to. So if I said nanometer, right, 10 to the negative nine meters, so if you had a meter and you cut it up basically into, what is that? Like a, a billion units, a billion units. Um, and so that's the sense of the size. And so where the quantum comes in there, and so quantum deals with physics that's very, very small. So as you become, as you start dealing with things that are smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, then you start dealing into a different realm of physics called quantum physics, quantum physics. And so to speak to that to a larger point, that's really the conversation, that same conversation is where quantum computing came out of. So what happened is that, you know, they were making computers and they made them smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Some of you might know this as Moore's Law. So it was by Gordon Moore. So he was the chairman of Intel. And he basically sort of prophesizes that computers will double in computing power every couple of years. He said exactly every 18 months, every 18 months, because we're, again, we're, we're having the size of our chips. But again, you can do that only for so long Right. And so you get to a point where there's a different type of physics, there's a different type of physics, quantum physics. So the rules are different. The rules are different. So now you've got to engineer it and using those rules as opposed to using the, the other rules before. Um, and so quantum affects nano, where, again, if you're making something that's really small, as you have to then look at it, not from a classical lens, but from a quantum lens. And that obviously means a whole range of things. But one of those things that it references is it, 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 the consequence of that statement is position. So, you know, I'm physically, and you know, obviously I'm right here, you're right there, everyone's, you know, sitting in their chair or whatever, you're, you're in a position. But with quantum is that the position isn't so clear. You can't really say like a, something, a particle is here, or here, or here, or here. And quantum, it's more like it's in this general region. And I can talk about that more in a second, but it's in this general region. So in other words, when you're building things that are small, that's one thing you have to consider is positioning. You're now going to a, a situation where there's something that's like right here in front of you, something you could touch and feel is now more in a general region where you can't really pinpoint it. You have to kind of describe what area it might be in. Um, so this is one of the consequences. <clears throat> and that speaks to, again, what quantum engineering is. People ask me, of course, what that is. Quantum engineering is really looking at the world through a quantum lens, you know, looking at a world saying, okay, how does quantum play into this? Or how does the philosophies or tenets of uh, quantum physics, how are they relevant to what we're doing? Uh, I'll give an example of that now. So with one thing with quantum, so I mentioned position, right? I said it was in a region. So then two, another thing about quantum is it's probabilistic, probabilistic, meaning that, you know, in the real world, you know, we said we flip a coin, you know, it's 50-50 chance of it being heads or tails. And quantum, it's a little different than that. So there's a, there's a percentage point that it might actually phase through the floor. There's always different percentages. 
where the, the results that you think are expected to happen won't necessarily happen. It won't necessarily happen. So in quantum, if you like hit your head against the wall, you know, a million, after a million times, at some point your head's going to face to the wall. At some point your head's going to face to the wall. So that's, so that's one of the, the rules of quantum is that like what we take for granted as facts isn't really fact, it's probabilistic. It's probabilistic. So what does that lend itself towards? So in finance, right? where it's difficult to predict with certainty the future, how a stock is going to perform up, down, left, right, you know, should I short it, what have you, is that quantum can come in and say, okay, well, this is a probabilistic problem. I'm um, basically, I'm good at probability. So I can tackle this probability problem, you know, in a way that's, that, that's really easy for me because I speak that language. So anyone that's been following the quantum computing um, arena has seen a lot, a lot of attention and activity in the, the finance region. The finance region, and which is something we knew about like years ago, actually. Um, but we decided to go to the biology and drug discovery uh, phase because of we basically want to create more of an impact than that. But quantum finance is something we saw like years ago. And again, it's because of that probabilistic nature to it, which quantum speaks quantum, quantum speaks probability. So that made a lot of sense. So, so yeah, that's 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 <laughs> that's all in that answer. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, like, how do you see quantum computing? in the future in terms of like how the common person will interact with it? That's, that's actually the thesis of Conduit. A uh, great question is how do we bring this to the masses? You know, so like we're not a company, um, let's say like Lockheed Martin, right? They make specifically weapons and, and materials for government. Like that's their thing, which is fine. You know, that's, that's them. But for us, our thing has always been more uh, in the line of like a, you know, Ford of an Apple, of a Sony. We really want to make things that are for consumers, ultimately, even if it's distributed through um, businesses, other businesses, we want it to ultimately be directly consumed by the consumer. Um, and so with that specific question is that's, that's the thing that we look at every day. Um, for us, you know, what I, what I foresee is really um, work in terms of wearables, wearables, and also in terms of human augmentation, for sure. Um, it could be, and the reason I say that is because there's a lot of, um, room there in the biology space. So remember guys, quantum computing is just a tool. A computer is just a tool. It's all just a tool. And that's why I think actually some of the challenge I've seen when people when I try and, you know, and explain conduit, who's like, okay, you're a quantum engineering company. Okay, how, how, does, how does a bio, da, 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 and all stuff fit into it or cloud is that I always remind them, is, listen, it's a tool. So it's not, you don't want to just, you, your company be based solely on the tool, right? But the problem that that tool, that tool solves, the problem that that tool solves. And so for us, we can make the quantum computing stuff but if we don't know what problem we're solving, right? It's like, it doesn't really work. Anyone, you know, who's done anything handy, right? There's either a certain screwdriver for a certain screw, you know, and you can't really mess up that order. So if I just said, can you make a screwdriver for any problem? You know, what would that even look like? So um, to your specific point, the reason I was saying the biology is because there's a lot of uh, potential there in the biology space. Um, biology, again, was one of those, those areas that was pinpointed, even going to the century as that's going to really going to be the area of innovation for us and revolution. So when you guys see like the sci-fi movies, and there's some like wearable biotech, that's they're kind of, they are kind of pointing to something there. Um, all the scientists and all this stuff, they're, they're, they're saying this, you know, in their conversations is that biology is really going to be the, what's going to take over this century. So things like uh, CRISPR with gene editing, um, you know, we all saw that with, that was like, the, the, like Dolly the Sheep was her name, Dolly the Sheep, they, they cloned in like late 90s or 2000s. So that's, 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 been, that's been accelerating and it's gonna only gonna accelerate further. Um, and so actually thereby these, these, it's actually really interesting for our time period because of the ethics around that, right? Because we're gonna be first time in ever where the questions of, you know, lifespan, you know, should humans die? Should they not die? If we have the ability to make them live for hundred years longer, can we, should we do that? Can we do that? You know, who gets access to that? You're kind of seeing some of those questions now in terms of access, right? With the vaccine, you know, who's, who's, who's who has first priority? You know, how do those things occur? Um, so so it's, this time period, I mean, is really interesting. But then what get used to the question of the wearables um, is a big one. And then two, I think it, what, our, what we want to do with it, um, I expect I can speak to that a lot more, is to do a, a like a wearable bio augmented type approach. Um, and I think that's, that lends up to our natural expertise, expertise, again, with the White House, with the Nano Splash. Um, and because we also we see a great future for nanotechnology, period, um, which is really, really exciting. You know, there's things like, for instance, there is uh, this, this robot, this idea that's kind of in the nanotech space. Um, so if you see this idea, someone took it from like a book or something. But it's this idea, this idea of these robots that like can go 
inside your body and use your glucose as energy. So you can eat like a huge, you know, donut and that won't, it won't mess up your insulin because the robots are using that sugar, right. To fuel some sort of, you know, repair operation in your body, you know? So that's, that's part of the Zyka. So we want to take the company in that direction. And again, all that stuff's so small that quantum comes into play, but again, quantum is just a tool to really solve these human needs. So last thing I'll say to that, to that question is, you know, right now I'm actually writing a quantum engineering book. Um, and you know, the first thing I'm doing with the book is explaining, you know, what is, what is the unique role of quantum engineering? What is the unique role of quantum computing? Because that's really the basic question of the answer, right? To answer your question, you know, but before we say how to bring it to the masses, okay, well, what can it, what can we bring to the masses? Like what, you know, what unique value add does this have that we want to bring out to the market, you know? And so those are really the questions you have to ask yourself. And what's interesting though, if you really think about it is like a lot of the, the problems we face now um, you know, we don't really need a quantum computer for it. You know, to be totally honest with you guys, you know, for like world hunger, you know, we don't, we don't need a quantum computer to solve world hunger. That's not like, there's not like someone saying like, if only we had a quantum computer, world hunger would be over. Like that, there's no one doing that. You know, if only we had a quantum computer, there'd be no more war. No one's doing that. You know, if only we had a quantum computer, there'd be better healthcare. No, no, no one's doing that, you know, and that's not, a lot of our problems now, guys, I mean, as we all have seen, <laughs> is that are really human problems. I mean, they're really, really, we were, we passed the phase you know, with the industrial revolution and the farmers revolution, where we're like, you know, we have to fight each other for food or land or survive. Like we don't know, we really don't need to fight anymore as a species or have these problems, but right, but we kind of choose to keep these things going. Um, so quantum computing really at its best is gonna be something that helps us get to a better version of ourselves. That helps us get to a better version of ourselves, you know, whatever that may be. But I think that that's how it can now keep in mind it will often definitely be used for something more capitalistic, something more probably some related to cats, you know, some sort of Pinterest, there's going to be some sort of Pinterest version of this somewhere. Like, that's cool. That's cool. They have that, they have their lane too. But I think what it can be, that's really important to note is used as a, as a technology, right. That helps us really become more aware and more in tune of ourselves and our connections with other people. And that's really, really important. Um, so that's what we, what we, what we look at day to day is what are the human problems, right. And why aren't those problems being solved again, like both hunger, war, stuff like that. Say, okay, where does quantum fit into that? And then in the day to day, you know, what are the basic issues that we all face that we can uh, make a dent in, a unique dent that only conduit can do? So yeah, that's awesome, and that's really interesting too because the more we get a grasp and the more we apply quantum computing, then essentially we're choosing our biology or we're choosing our right. evolution as we go forward. So that's really cool. Well, another question I had was like, for those of the people in the audience who are really interested in quantum engineering or they want to become a quantum engineer. What would they need to learn or what tools can they start working with, playing with so that they can start right. learning quantum engineering? Right. No, that's, that's a great question. Um, so the, the first thing um, I would say is you, I mean, obviously you've got, you've got to know uh, quantum. That's, that's the first thing, just getting there, right? So it's this, in quantum engineering, there's a lot of different ways to approach it. So usually the way someone approaches, they kind of have one really strong point, really strong angle. Right. And then the rest are supplementary skill sets. So in other words, what I'm saying is that someone might be a mathematician, right? That might be, I'm a math person, but I'm approaching the quantum space. So I know a little bit of quantum. I know a little bit of computer science, right? But math's like really my, my thing. Or same thing, it could be a computer scientist and say, okay, I'm really coming in, into this at a computer science angle. And I'm again going to learn a little bit of quantum, learn a little bit of math, right? To, to supplement my skill set. Uh, specifically for, for quantum engineering, right? Is you're going to want to have exposure really to a lot of a wide uh, breadth of things, a lot, a lot of uh, different options, opportunities. But at the same time, um, you're gonna want to have a certain a T, what's called a T uh, skill set. And anyone's read uh, what is it called? Um, Zero to One by Peter Thiel he knows what I'm talking about. He so he may mentions this in the book. Is that you want to have that one key skill set that you have, and then like an exposure to a lot of uh, breadth. So specifically, um, of course, mathematics. I'd say that's the core. If you had to pick a core skill set to have it's got to be mathematics because that's the universal language you know that's universal language of the, of the universe of god you know and einstein's the word he said god doesn't god speaks in the language of mathematics you know so um mathematics is key uh, mathematics is my favorite subject and then two then going i would actually say um philosophy if i if i had to pick one more to be really be your core because when you're talking about quantum there's a lot of unexplored questions um number one number two actually what you were just talking about basically controlling the biology you know, there, there's a lot of deep questions there too that I think it, it's important to have a philosophical mindset when you're approaching because you're talking about the future.
you can think outside the box. Um, like, so for instance, um, I love reading about the critiques of rationalism. So Rene Descartes, you know, says, every part of your body, including your brain is an organ, you know? So in other words, your thoughts are really, it's a sensory organ, same with your tongue, right? So you taste it sour in your tongue. You never say I'm sour. You know, you would say that I'm tasting something, I'm experiencing something that is sour, but we don't look at our thoughts that way because of our philosophy. So when you explore yourself to different philosophies, say, okay, you know, my thoughts can be just a result of what's around me. And you can see this easily. You know, if you, if you stand up, you know, if you get up and stand up, stand up outside, there's by you know, got the sun on you, you're gonna think different thoughts. You know, and if you have your phone on versus you don't have different thoughts, you know, so your thoughts are very much so related and reflected by your environment. And so it's, again, to that point, to your main point about the question about what should you study, philosophy and mathematics have to be key because again, you're gonna be able to undo a lot of that thinking um, in terms of how to look at the world and also how to build inside that world. You know, there are two, those are two big things to do, right? how to look at the world, very, very challenging, and how to build in the world. Because you want to build a way that adds value. So if you don't have a good grasp of the world at some level, at least your own world, the world you're operating in, then you're just going to end up repeating and recreating your own ignorance rather than creating something that's novel and unique. So I'd say philosophy, mathematics. And then um, after that, I would say really it's computer science. Computer science is key. Because when you're talking about... Uh, you know, quantum computers specifically, right? It, the, it's, it's, a, it's basically, it's, it's a niche field of computer science, right? So it's like, it's like making like, like a devil's chocolate cake. Like you gotta know how to make cake first, right? But you gotta know how to make chocolate cake second, right? Then you gotta know how to make the, the devil's chocolate cake. So you wanna build that foundation. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of philosophical uh, implications there when you study computer science. Like for instance, my professor, Seth Lloyd, he wrote a book called Programming the Universe about how the universe can be seen as a quantum computer computing itself, computing itself, you know? So, and that would explain both the, um, a lot of the combinations we're seeing, the probabilities we're seeing, but also the uniqueness, the inexplicable part of our nature, you know, in terms of our society. And so I'd say studying those three things, um, philosophy, mathematics, computer science would be a really strong foundation. Um, in terms of specific tools, I'd recommend there's, there's something called, it's called QSKIT, QSKIT, uh, people don't really pronounce it, but it's called QSKIT. That's a good uh, computer software, helps you simulate uh, quantum, quantum algorithms really well. Um, what else? And then two in terms of, I would say books actually, books that would be good to, to read, would say, I would say actually that book, Programming the Universe, number one. I would say also you wanna read the OGs, you know, you wanna read like the direct, direct notes of the people who wrote this stuff. So um, like Schrodinger, read about, read anything by, by Schrodinger. Um, and then also one of the other books I recommend would be Doors of Perception. Doors of Perception, which is a famous book. Um, I'd be saying his last name wrong, but Thomas Adley, I'd be saying that wrong. But um, famous book. And again, it's about that question of um, how do you perceive the world? Um, and I'll explain now actually why that perception is so important. So in quantum, right, it, what, what, the thing that about quantum that blew people up, they're like, like, what? I don't understand. How is this going on? This is crazy. Is because in quantum, the the world basically recognizes the effect of your perception, the effect of your perception. So Newton's world, right? We go back to 1600s. Actually, and again, I don't know if you guys know this, he actually wrote his work during a plague. There was a, a breakout of the plague and he just went back home. Like, all right, well, I'm just, just like, keep doing math. And he just creates like math. He creates math, he creates calculus, creates three laws, creates the laws of optics. Like he just definitely did his homework times 10. He's that guy who goes home, does his homework, comes back, you know, every assignment's already done for the year. He was that guy times 10. But um, with Newton, right, you have, a, you have an apple, again, you drop it. That's what I was saying before. With an apple, you drop it, you know it's, you know it's going to fall. Like, you're, for a fact, it's going to fall, period. But quantum, it's not necessarily that way. So before I said probability, right, so you, okay, it might fall, it might, not, it might fall to the ground, right, or it might face through the ground. You know, that, that's a probability. probability. But there's also the probability of just is of perception. It's called the measurement effect, the measurement effect. So when you think again philosophically about measurement, so first I'm gonna give the example, and I'm gonna show you guys the philosophy behind it. So when they did an experiment, it's called a double slit experiment, 
And double slit experiment is they hadn't, they basically shot these electrons through these slits, double slit experiment, right? And they, long story short, they shot a particle. Remember, we we're talking about particles. So shooting a particle, right, through the slit. There's two slits, right? So you can particle can only go through one slit at a time. You know, same thing for you. If there's two doors, right, you can only go through one door at a time. But then they looked at the results and they found particles going through both slits, through both slits. And like, obviously they're like, okay, that makes no sense. I'd be like, again, two doors, I'm going through both doors, how? And the crazy part is that it turns out, I'm gonna save you guys the, the, the lecture. It turns out is that what happened is that the particle when it was not being observed, acts like a wave. So it was able to go through both, through both doors at the same time. So think about that. So think about the door example. So there's two doors, there's one person, there's one me. I can only go through one door at a time, right? But if I'm a wave, right, then I can go through, I'm a, I'm a ripple, I'm a ripple in space. So I can go through both doors. So, at the, so ironically at the end, you're seeing me come from both doors when if I'm a particle, there's a solid thing, it's one door. And so, but what, what, what causes that difference, right? Okay, it's a particle one time, it's a wave another time. That difference comes from um, you measuring it. So once you've looked at it, Right. So once you so so in other words, say you're you're in the room while you're doing this experiment, the double slit experiment, you're shooting the particles. You got to think about what is measurement, right? So, and I, I'll, I'll I'll keep it simple for you guys. Measurement is when you measure something, you're affecting something. There's no way to observe something without also affecting that thing. So in other words, I'll tell and I'll give you the physical example of this. So we're looking at the double slit experiment, right? Okay, you're you're looking at the the, the electrons, right? As they're coming in, you're, you're like staring at it. But think about it. Think about your brain for a second. How do you see anything, right? So the, the light has to hit your eye. It creates a neural signal, right, to your brain. Your brain says, this is the image that you're seeing. It's actually, and you guys know it's, it's, it's upside down. So your eye then reverses it right side up, you know? And so you've gotten a signal, right? And then you then have spit out an output saying, this is the image that I've seen. So when you're looking at that electron, you're not just like looking at it, right? Something had to hit that electron, hit your eye. Your brain processed that image come back and now you have an image in your mind. So anytime you're measuring, you're looking at anything, right? You're actually affecting it. You're affecting it. And I, I use the example of uh, teachers and testing, right? So if I'm a teacher and I want to know what you guys know, I say, okay, I'm going to give you a test, you know, at the end of this lecture, whatever, is that how you perform on that, right? Has many different variables to it. So you could just like not understand the question. English cannot be your first language. Um, you know, you got to go to the bathroom so you can't think. And so there's all these different variables that would affect the output. So when, you, when you're measuring something, you're affecting that thing. Even if it was a surprise test in that example, right? Again, you can just be a bad test taker. You have super anxiety while you're taking the test. So again, me make, doing an active, I want to know what you know, creates an effect where I'll never fully get to understand what you guys know because it's just the fact that I'm measuring it changes the whole situation and that's actually how and that's a philosophical tenet that quantum physics proves about the world is that when you measure something and then that you'll, you'll be observed by it um, and this is actually something that if you begin to study buddhism they talk about this is that the observed and the observer will become one and the same the observed and the observer become one and the same and there's also different parallels in other religions and, and spiritual texts too but that's just one i want to bring up but yeah awesome also i was wondering about um wait how so you can go because you have my <laughs> Yeah, I just, I noticed, um, like, clearly you definitely have a whole lot of passion in this subject and everything, and I wanted to know what sparked that, and so much so to even right. create a whole major <laughs> in quantum engineering, like, I want to know what kind of drove that from the beginning and how that continued to grow. Oh, man, that's great. That's a great question. So it it started out, man, where I, I always, one, I always want to be an inventor. Um, so those are like, so there's like these kind of three or four major, just in a business or science from assumptions but just like things that were just about me that you know define my future path and one of them was that one um i wanted i knew that i wanted to make history that was number one um and two um i knew that i was good at a, a lot of different things um but i knew that something like this entrepreneurship doing something like quantum computing making your own major would test that ability to the to its max so it's kind of like, all right, you ran this race, you, had, you know, 10 seconds. Let's see if you can do it in nine seconds. And so it's like that type of mentality. Like, all right, yeah, you're good at all these things. What happens if we tax that to the maximum? You know, how far will you go? Um, so now, and, and so, so I'll speak to that point in a second. And then the third point, man, was really just, you know, seeing the, 
the world and just w- wanting to be a better place. Those are the, the three big things. So it was like the, the humanitarian desire for impact, the more um, like self-focused drive of wanting to make history. And then three, just also just from a perspective of, um, I really just, I think just seeing the opportunity that was available with quantum engineering. So some of the invention aspect. So I'll talk about the invention aspect first. So the invention aspect, you know, when I was, again, when I was a kid, I was writing out different inventions and all this stuff and um, always wanted to make my own tech company. Always, always wanted to do that. And so going into that is I knew that's why I went to MIT. So I said, okay, I know how to, you know, again, I know, I know business, you know, I, and at this point I'd done poetry and stuff like that. I've been a football team, I was all these different clubs and stuff. I said, but I really want to have the utmost technical expertise so that I can perform again at a very, very high level. Because like I have the business expertise, how do I get the technical expertise to again perform at a high level? So that you know, when I'm leading my my team, my company, right, I can understand the scientist and the engineer and the lawyer and the accountant and the salesperson. I can be that nexus, you know, where everyone can communicate. And I actually funny enough, that's actually what ended up happening is that now you know again I can talk to the business person and, and they get what get what they're saying and vice versa. And I'm talking to you guys now. So I basically trained myself to, you know, to be in this position I'm in right now. Um, so like what you're saying now is literally like a c- conscious, contrived, intentional plan from like when I was like 12 years old, you know, uh, very conscious every, every day, day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. Um, so it's been cool to again, see that, that plan come to, to fruition. But um, so that, that was the invention aspect. And then again, I, I'd seen in that invention aspect, I'd seen so many things man, that I wanted to like invent, but and I just wasn't in a position to do. Like I, I remember being in chemistry class and think of different principles, you know, like the equilibrium principle that equations have to balance out to equilibrium. You know, I flipped the page and someone's already discovered that, you know, so I kept basically doing things and people would already do them, you know, so I was like, ah, so, okay, what can I do, right? That's new, that's really new. And I can sink my teeth into with all my ability. So quantum, talking about the last question, actually, what, you know, what do you need to learn? The reason I love quantum is because you have to learn everything <laughs> at the same time. So you got to learn, again, like I was saying, philosophy, mathematics, computer science, um, you know, and you have to, again, now biology, machine learning, um, you know, government funding for the White House stuff. Like, you know, you got to learn everything from, again, that's what I was saying, the, the knowing it and then the doing it, making it happen aspect. You got the scientific theoretical stuff on the board, and then you've got the real world, you know, day-to-day execution of that, which are two very different things. Um, and they both, again, demand a lot, especially if you're doing both. Because you have to, again, you have to, it demands the best of every one of your skills, every single one of your skill sets. Um, you know, and so I think that's, so that's the, that, and unfortunately my team appreciates that because they can just do what they're doing, you know, not worry about all the other aspects. So that was the invention aspect, doing something new, sinking my teeth into something. That's one. Um, two, for the um, testing the ability part, again, I was, like I was saying, is that, you know, I've, I've made a poetry book, I've done music. Um, you know, I, let's see, I play saxophone, you know, so I get, I'm just good at a lot of these different things. And so for me, I was like, okay, how do you, and even when I was in, when I was in my fraternity, actually, when I was in high school and in college, I was always kind of known as that person that, you know, if you need to get something done, that was me, you know, like under budget, you know, less time than normal, you know, I could get it done. And so how do you challenge that person to like the ultimate max, you know, you give them like, okay, let's do something that's never been done before. You know, all right, you can, you know, you can form, you can do this, you can plan this event, you know, and like half the time, half the budget, whatever you can, you know, graduate from MIT again, these really hard, hard things. All right, now you've got to go harder and go harder and go harder, you know, and, and see, okay, how far can you really stretch that ability? Um, and this has been an interesting ability to stretch because again, it's been the coordination of all the, all the ability. Uh, but also for us is it's taken a lot of, but with, with good things, right? It takes a long time to build them up. Like you could be the most diligent, like person, we can same say for working out, right? Nutrition on point, eating salads every day, but it's gonna take some time for you to see results. That's just what it is. Like you could be perfect at something, but it just takes time to see results. You're not gonna go from like zero to a hundred in one day. And so, and in fact here, the diligence required isn't just again in the skill set, right? The leadership and the speaking and the quantum, but it's actually in the patience. The patience is probably one of the biggest skill sets. So like how to be in, basically being able to take the punches Right, and keep going and keep going and keep going. So even if I was like me, all the traits of me, but I didn't have the patience, or just honestly the pain tolerance, right? That I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. You know, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. Um, and so it, it tests that to its max. And then, but in doing so, it pushes you further, right? It pushes you further than you've ever gone. You know, so if I had just um, done something else with my skill set, you know, I could be using one or two skills and still getting paid really nice, which is cool. 
and that's totally fine. But again, for me, I'm like, how can I outdo myself every time? Because for me, my like idols or what have you, um, the people that I look up to are like, you know, the people who are like so great. You know, you guys got to remember too, it's one thing to be great in your, in like that day, that year, 10 years, and in your, in your lifetime. It's nothing to be great for like generations, for generations. Like that's different. Like you got to remember, like a lot of the mathematicians, like Archimedes, Plato, all this stuff, like the old OGs, I like, like to call them, they outlasted their whole civilization. The whole, can, you imagine, can you imagine you're like you're, you're, you're this, this guy just walking around you're at trial these people hate your guts right they know like you're gonna send you to death and you got and little do they know that you're the only memory that they're gonna have of those people ever that's insane for your whole civilization so your civilization's been around for imagine like in your, your own life right america's been around 300 years a thousand years from now they don't even mention much america but they mention your name you know that's that's really crazy and so I'm not to say that from like an egotistical perspective of like, oh, you know, me, 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 but more so can you like, can you challenge yourself to the point where you can take, you can extract that greatness from yourself? You know, any, all of us are capable of greatness, you know, in our own right. But I think it's about, <clears throat> again, extracting that and pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, right? So much so that you get that, you get those diamonds, you get those diamonds. And so that's why I do a conduit, you know, is we have a team of people that are constantly focused on extracting that last bit of greatness and then directing that into a specific direction. And that's how we've gotten the progress we've gotten so far. Where again, we've made history a bunch of times, made comparative Steve Jobs a bunch of times. We've you know, gotten a patent for this and that. We're working with the White House, da, da, da. Uh, is again, just like that push. And so that, that historical standard being so great, again, of lasting for whatever generation is more about, you know, can you achieve that level of basic personal development, right, on your own? Now, keep in mind, that doesn't have to be anyone else's standard. That's just my standard, because that's just what I enjoy you know is this what i enjoy so so yeah well, I would okay i so that um yeah so one of the questions i had about one of the things you said was you know if you're going to be in quantum you have to be like you said a jack of all trades but right. then the other part master of none so i'm wondering like what's your take on that because that's something i wrestle with too because like yeah because like i came from a computer science background but now i'm like i want that math background and so but i'm also like i love physics and so like i'm wondering like, right on that and like learning all those things and like you said you have to get theoretical but then as an engineer especially a real world engineer yes. industry, you have to put that into practice right so yeah what's your take on that oh man and what i, I can totally relate to that too because not only so engineer right you have to put it into practice but then entre, ent, engineer entrepreneur right you've got to like execute it get the funding for it you've got to can pitch people you got to make the pitch deck and the one page you're in the website and the yeah, so I definitely feel that actually part of the nano splash conversation we had internally was like we we could have done some really far out stuff, talking about like talking about the nano robots and the glucose, but we said, okay, what can we do in a, like more immediately, right? In the short term time period, like you know, one year, two years type thing. So there's projects like you know, these guys probably won't see for a few years that are like insane that we that we could genuinely implement, but it's like, okay, what can we do within a short time span? So I can under, so I understand what you're saying. Um, so the way I do it is Really, I think as you, you try, you have to try to find the intersections of all these fields, the intersections. That's, and that's really, once you get into that, that place, it's going to help a lot. So um, I use the example, I, one thing I, I, I use is etymology, etymology, right? So whether I'm talking about quantum or literature, I look at it through this lens of etymology. I say, okay, well, what are the words? You know, what, is, what do words mean? You know, and, and when you now talk about words, you know, we start studying computer science, it's how you start talking about communicating information, right? And so in other words, what you want to do is you want to craft this structure in your brain. Okay, well, yes, quantum seems different from literature, seems different from computer science, but what are the fundamentals that I can draw from that and take from with me everywhere? Um, so when I get one lens, I, I'll mention one more too, but one lens is again, is etymology. It's, 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 it's basically how do you communicate, communication theory. So you want to look at everything. This is this will be really helpful. Look at everything as communication and expression. So even when we look at an amazing pianist, right? Is that what really what they're doing? They're amazing, but they're amazing because they can communicate themselves. They can express themselves. You know, same thing with the bodybuilder. You know, they all oh, this amazing bodies because they've they've expressed their willpower right onto their body. So you want to always look at it, look at everything through communication. So when I'm talking about quantum, and I'm saying okay, I want to make this physical product. Right, quantum, I'm going to make personal quantum computers and wearables and technology. Da, da. What I'm saying to myself is, in my mind, is okay, what do I really want to communicate? What do I want to communicate? So when I create a nano splash, when I'm creating nano splash, what I'm saying is okay, and that's why I'm saying philosophy is so important because 
the way you create is a reflection of the creator. Creation is reflect a reflection of the creator. And same thing, I was, and I see that's the same kind of paradox of thinking for the observ observation effect. The observe becomes the observer, the observer becomes the observed. So there's like these paradoxes. So that is how the world works. So then go back to the lens of communication is this, so I'm making this physical product. Okay, what have I communicated? What have, what, what have I, what, what values have I embedded into this physical product? So with Nanosplash, based on the things I was telling you, is that I, we value simplicity, right? It's just a bottle, you spit into it, boom. So the fact that I made that shows that I believe that simplicity is one important and two people want simplicity. People uh, want simplicity and I believe simplicity is important. So you wanna say, what are you communicating? Um, and if you take that lens of communication to your different fields, it'll, it'll help screen out the fundamentals. And so then to that point, <clears throat> I'll take that one step deeper. So we talked about communication and expression. Two, symbols. Symbols are very, very important. I think symbols is one of those lenses, again, that will, if you look at it from everything from a lens of symbol, symbols and symbolism, it'll help you in all your different fields. So I'll use, it, I'll use that, that lens for what I do, the entrepreneurship engineer thing. So with symbols, right, I'm saying, okay, for the brand, what does our brand as a symbol, what does it represent? You know, again, what am I communicating, right? What, what, is it, what does a symbol communicate to my audience, number one? Number two, then for in terms of symbols, then I'm looking at the structure of the bottle. What, again, what am I communicating? And then I'm thinking, okay, how, is that same way you communicate to, you know, you're going to communicate to your mom differently than your dad, differently than your friends. Okay, is, has my communication tailored appropriately to my audience? Is it tailored appropriately to my audience? So that's why I see communication so useful. Then you're talking about, okay, now it's, that's the humanities, da, da, da. Now let's go back to the technical side. If we're talking about the White House, we're at communication. You know, so we then, we simulate the genes on the supercomputer. So I say, okay, how accurately does the DNA symbolize the structure of the virus? In other words, if I use this DNA to construct this virus, how accurately am I going to be able to simulate this virus? Is it going to be 99% accurate? Is it going to be 100% accurate? You know, how closely in line is that expression, right, going to be to the intention? The expression to the intention. So I'm saying, okay, what I'm creating on this computer as a symbol. And so I'm interacting with the symbol as a way to interact with the real thing. So looking at things, so lens of communication, one, uh, two, symbolism. And I think I would guess three would be expression will help you a lot in those different fields. So then again, with the scientists, think about what they're trying to express and it'll help you a lot. Yeah, well, that was, that was great. And I just want to say <laughs> like, as like, a last thing I would like to point out um, before we get off, cause we do have to um, start our next um, mm -hmm. talk soon. But I did want to say that it, it is amazing um, what you've been able to accomplish. It's amazing that you've been able to raise so much funding and like that you've been able to like, you know, um, start a company at like MIT, what, like your sophomore year, your second year. And so yeah. that's, that's intense. That's pretty crazy. And, and I know like, um, and hopefully like we've had so much fun talking to you and this is like mm -hmm. something I've been struggling with since like yesterday was like everybody It's just, we're having a good time asking people questions and like, yeah, right. but, um, yeah, I guess we would also like at some point like like to hear about like because I know you touched on it a little bit like just what it's been like raising funding for you like mm. as a black man. So yeah, I think that would definitely be something you <laughs> talked about. But I talked a little bit about like what that was at some point. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, Ryan. And, definitely. Uh, yeah, of course, guys. Anytime, feel free to reach out. Uh, I love next time to talk about the, the investor stuff. You know, that's, that's definitely an interesting topic. Yeah. Uh, definitely, definitely. Oh, yeah, most definitely, man. I'm glad That's you came in. Cool. Likewise. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, guys. Have a good one. All right, you right. too. Bye. Cheers, man.